Hello, I'm Simon Kennan, editor of Interventional Cardiology Review, and I'm here with John Webb at EuroPCR 2015 to talk about the latest Sapien 3 data. John, welcome. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you. Um, there's a variety of trials going on at the moment with the Sapien 3. Could you just outline them for us? Well, there's a series of trials. The, the first trial that we reported a year ago was the Sapien 3 CMART trial, which was Europe and Canada, 16 centers. And uh, that was a relatively small trial, 150 patients, transfemoral, transapical. And uh, the dramatic thing was the outcomes in the transfemoral group, which is, I think, the default strategy these days. That showed a, a low 2.1% mortality at 30 days, which was dramatically low for a largely high-risk cohort. Uh, lower than any surgical series and lower than any previous large uh, uh, um, multi-center adjudicated uh, trial. And the stroke rate of 1.1% uh, with uh, no debilitating, no disabling strokes was also one of the lowest ever reported. So dramatically good results. Uh, no coronary occlusions, no valve embolizations, no valves, just very clean results. And very importantly, the paravalvular leak uh, issue had not entirely, but almost completely gone away mm -hmm. with a uh, incidence of moderate leaks of, uh, uh, I think, about 2.5%. I don't have the number in front of me, yeah. but no severe leaks. So a dramatic reduction in paravalvular leaks, a dramatic reduction in stroke, dramatic reduction in mortality. So really very positive results at 30 days. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the interim, um, this has been reproduced in the partner Sapien 3 intermediate risk trial which showed a dramatically low mortality rate of 1.1% in, in patients with a um, anticipated surgical risk much higher than that. And the stroke risk was about the same, about 1.1%. So really these are better than any surgical series, um, and, and it's not low risk patients we're talking about. Um, that was a thousand patient trial, and now we have the uh, uh, one year follow up of the original European Canadian trial. Uh, and at one year, the results are durable. There were actually no cardiovascular deaths between one month and one year. So dramatically low um, or, or high, 91.6% uh, survival yeah. at one year, which is really good for these patients, elderly patients with comorbidities, the best ever reported in a large adjudicated trial, 91.6% one year survival. And, uh, and the stroke uh, rate, there's only another 1% strokes at one year, which is dramatically l low. Yeah. even lower than you might expect in this population. So, and the, the paravalvular leaks, in fact, the moderate leaks were less than half the, uh, uh, one year than they were at 30 days. So, yeah. if anything, they're not getting worse, they're getting, getting better. And, uh, and then the latest trial is the Sapien 3 uh, EU Continued Access Registry, which is now just slightly lower intermediate risk patients. And, uh, uh, and only transfemoral, which has become the default strategy, and this produces uh, really the best results yet, with a uh, one um, uh, with a 30-day mortality of just one percent, and again uh, no embolizations, no coronary obstruction, the paravalvular leak uh, rate identical to the other two trials, with no severe leaks and moderate leaks, and uh, just between two and three percent of patients, which is really mm -hmm. very excellent, mm -hmm. and and still low stroke rates, and importantly. In the early trials, um, we were seeing pacemaker rates a little higher than we've seen with balloon expandable valves, but in the in this later study, the continued access, now with a policy of less aggressive oversizing and implanting the valve a little higher in the annulus, the pacemaker rate's now down to 4%, which is as good as it ever was with balloon expandable valves and dramatically better than uh, than most other valves available. Yeah, just talking about oversizing, what do you think is the ideal percentage oversize now? Because we used to talk about <coughs> five to fifteen percent area oversize. What do you what do you like? So now? you know, very controversial because I think for one thing it depends on what the how you measure the annulus. So mm -hmm. in the old days we used a transthoracic echo and then TEE, and really it's become now necessary to do three dimensional CT yeah. evaluation of the annulus and come up with an area or perimeter. And remember, oversizing area and perimeter isn't the same. They, no. they're one is a uh, larger than the other. So, yeah, I think we're talking sort of 5 to 10 percent is yeah. optimal. But the interesting thing about the Sapien 3 is if you have an accurate size, you don't necessarily need to oversize at all. 
In fact, you can get away with putting in a valve that's slightly smaller than the annulus. Yeah. It's clear that leaks do go up if you do that a little bit, but if you're concerned about annular injury, that's the thing to do is often just put in a slightly smaller valve and you still get away with it. So if we're saying that ideally we want an oversize of maybe 0 to 5 percent, then how many valve sizes do we need? So, um, uh, well that's ideal, but there's a range uh, beyond that. So it's pretty clear that you can oversize Bay Area up to 20 percent uh, safely if there isn't a lot of calcium in the LVOT, not the leaflets we're talking about, but below the valve in the mm -hmm. LVOT. So we can oversize up to 20 percent or so and we can undersize up to 5%, mm -hmm. and within those ranges we can get pretty good results. Um, you know, <clears throat> ideally it'd be nice to have even more sizes of valves, but that's not going to be available for a while. Is it coming down the track? Well, I think there's various approaches to either more sizes of valves uh, or valves that can be, uh, have their size adjusted slightly. So there's certain strategies about how that might be done. Yeah. And I think you'll be hearing more about that. Excellent. Just going back to the pacemaker rate, is that all explained by just where the valve is deployed? I'm just thinking in comparison to other valves where the pacemaker rate <coughs> can be 20, even 25, 30 percent. And the Edwards valve, the Sapien valve, is still deployed in the left ventricular outflow tract, perhaps only for two or three millimeters, but it is still deployed there. So is, is that the whole explanation for the low rate, the position? You know, there's there's all sorts of factors that predispose to AV block, including a pre-existing right bundle branch block and yeah. age and all sorts of other things. I think, it, it, although it's difficult to show, I think the degree of oversizing is important. So if you put in slightly smaller valves, as with Sapien 3 with the sealing skirt, we can put in slightly smaller valves and still get good sealing. I think that results in lower pacemaker rates. It also has to do with whether the valve pushes into the septum um, uh, a cylindrical valve will push in less than a valve that flares at the bottom. So it has to do with the design to some extent. But but yes, largely the depth of implant is just very important and it's become clear with this valve, it being a little longer, that we have to position it a little higher to get it just right. In the early experience we implanted lower, the pacemaker rates were you know, 14 percent and then 10 percent and now they're 4 percent with people implanting them a little bit higher and still getting the good ceiling. So, I think that's been shown with other valves as well. Is it's the, to a large degree how deep it goes in the LVT is one of the very important mm. determinants. Mm. Okay, and it's a taller valve, but no zero percent coronary obstruction. So that's very so it's reassuring. about three millimeters longer in each of the different sizes of valve, which is not very much longer, three millimeters. Uh, and it, it, it is possible implanted so that the top struts do extend up to the coronaries, but the top struts of the valve are not covered by fabric, so yeah. not, they don't seal or occlude. In fact, the, the valve itself doesn't occlude the coronaries really. The, the concern is really the native leaflets covering the coronaries, and that isn't any greater risk than it was before. Okay. Um, part in the 2A. In fact, in those trials, remember, there weren't any. Indeed. Occlusion, so yeah, that's so it's fantastic. A, so by screening, uh, it should be very rare. Yeah, okay. Um, partner 2A trial, intermediate risk randomized data, ballpark time for when we're going to hear. So this is going to be a landmark trial when it comes out, <coughs> and we're hoping it may be a little bit the end of the story about which, what most people should have as their primary therapy. That's going to be, I think, later on this year we're going to see results from, from that. And that's <coughs> with the Sapien XT. That'll be the Sapien XT. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank I, you very much. Thank you very much.